We're here with Robert Kennedy Jr. at uh, the Waterkeeper International Conference. I want to say thank you to you for taking the time to join us on the show today. Thank you for having me. You bet. So uh, let's get right into it. Let's let's talk about water, um, the essence of life, obviously. Um, what inspired you um, to be involved and essentially be you know the founder? I know it started a long time ago with the the Hudson River, but what inspired you to? get involved with Waterkeeper and um, perpetuate this work? Well, I grew up on the water and both, you know, on the ocean and, and my father was really passionate about um, particularly white water and, you know, I had us all kayaking and um, doing white water from when we were little. But I also spent every spare moment of my um, young life in streams, turning up rocks, catching fish, um, hunting and fishing. So I was like an outdoors person. I, uh, and I knew that I wanted to be an environmental advocate from when I was very, very little. In fact, when I was eight years old, I wrote a, wrote a letter to my uncle, President Kennedy, um, asking to meet with him about the problem of pollution. And, uh, and I had a meeting at the Oval Office. At age eight? Yeah. Um, You've been out this a while. So, well, I always knew that this was what I wanted to do. In 1984, I fell in with a group of fishermen on the Hudson, of commercial fishermen, and they had launched a group that was then called the Hudson River Fishermen's Association, and they were suing polluters. And they had started in 1966, which was uh, four years before Earth Day. So they were early arrivals, and they had, you know, we have on the Hudson one of the oldest commercial fisheries in North America. It's 350 years old. Many of the people that I've represented for the past three decades come from families that have been fishing the river for three and a half centuries, mm -hmm. um, since Dutch colonial times. They use the same fishing methods that were taught by the Algonquin Indians to the original Dutch settlers of New Amsterdam. It's a traditional gear fishery and it's a sustainable fishery. Very, very carefully managed fishery for, like I said, three centuries. And it was shad, sturgeon, herring, alewives, um, uh, blue crab, shrimp, and they even had a, 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 a carp fishery and a goldfish fishery, a perch, yellow perch, um, and catfish, bullhead, and eel. And it, it was a booming fishery. Mm -hmm. And they, in the early 60s, they saw their livelihoods being destroyed by polluters. Uh, the Penn Central Railroad was vomiting oil from a four and a half foot pipe into the Croton Harmon rail yard. The oil went up the river on the tides, blackened the beaches, made the shad taste of diesel. Hmm. And all of these people, 300 members of one of the communities, one of the enclaves of the commercial fishery was a little village called Crotonville, New York. It's 30 miles north of New York City on the east bank of the river. The people who live there were not your prototypical environment, you know, kind of affluent environmentalists. They were factory workers and carpenters and lathers and electricians. Half the people in Crotonville made their living, or at least some part of it, fishing or crabbing the Hudson. These were people who had little expectation that they'd ever see Yosemite or the Yellowstone or the National Park or the Everglades. They, you know, for them, the environment was their backyard. It stayed close to home. Yeah, it was their bathing beaches, their swimming holes, their fishing holes. It was their livelihood, their recreational values. It was their summer vacation, their winter vacation, everything wrapped into that resource. So when the polluters started you know, privatizing it and stealing it, they were actually stealing something very valuable, essential, existential um, for these, these communities. And they all came together in the American Legion Hall in March of 1966. Crotonville was a very patriotic community. They had one of the highest mortality rates during World War II of any community in our country. Virtually the entire male population joined the Marines after Pearl Harbor. So these weren't radicals or militants. They were people whose patriotism was rooted in the bedrock of our country. But that night they started talking about violence because they saw something they thought they owned, 
um, the abundance of these fisheries that their parents had exploited for generations and the purity of the Hudson's waters and those things were being stolen from them by large corporate entities over whom they had no control. And they had been to the government agencies that are charged with protecting Americans from pollution to the Corps of Engineers, the, the State Conservation Department and the Coast Guard, and they were given the buttons rush. Mm -hmm. The Corps Colonel in Manhattan, Richie Gard, who was the first president of, of Waterkeeper, was a former Marine combat veteran from Korea and another Marine named Art Glauca, went to the Corps of Engineers office on 20 separate occasions begging the Colonel to do his job and shut down the Penn Central Pipe. And he finally told them in exasperation, these are important people. Speaking of the Penn Central Board of Directors, he said, we can't treat them that way. In other words, we can't force them to comply with environmental laws. And, um, and so by this evening of March of 1966, virtually everybody in Crotonville had come to the conclusion that government was in cahoots with the polluters. And the only way that they were going to reclaim the river for themselves is if they confronted the polluters directly. And somebody suggested that they put a match to the oil slick coming out of the Penn Central pipe. Somebody else said they should roll a mattress up and jam it up the pipe and flood the rail yard with its own ways. So that, these were the, the water protectors all the way back then? Uh, I mean, but they, you know, they didn't see themselves as environmentalists. They were just, they were people who were trying to, who saw themselves as part of the environment. Right, but they were ready to put their freedom or their bodies potentially. Yeah, they were willing to do whatever it took. I mean, they talked about floating raft of dynamite into the intake of the Indian Point power plant, which at that time was killing a million fish a day on its intake screens and taking food off their family tables. Wow. Then a guy stood up at that meeting who was another Korean war vet, and he was a famous fly fisherman. And he, had, um, he was a writer. He was actually the outdoors editor for Sports Illustrated magazine. His name was Robert Boyle, and he died recently. He passed away. Um, but he was, a, one, he was a kind of an iconic um, fly fisherman and spin fisherman as well. He'd written half a dozen books on angling. He'd won, he was one of the gurus of dry fly tying in America. And he had written, two years before, he had written an article about angling in the Hudson, this fascinating article about sewer fishing clubs and all these kind of weird, odd people who were still fishing the Hudson for Sports Illustrated. And in researching that article, he had came across an ancient navigational statute called the 1888 Rivers and Harbors Act. That statute said that it was illegal to pollute any waterway in the United States. You had to pay a big penalty if you got caught. But also there was a bounty provision that said that anybody who turned in the polluter got to keep half the fine. And he had sent a copy of that over to the libel lawyers at Time Magazine, which owns Sports Illustrated. Said, so, so it was almost like the, the whistleblower. It was, and he said, yeah, but he, he said, uh, but it was a bounty. And he said, um, he said to the lawyer, is this still good law? And they sent him a memo back saying, in 80 years, this bounty provision has never been enforced a single time. It's still on the books and it's still good law. And, and at that point, Bob stood up in front of this group that was talking about violence. He said, we shouldn't be talking about breaking the law. We should be talking about enforcing it. And they resolved that evening. They were going to start a group that was then called the Hudson River Fishermen's Association. It later became Riverkeeper. And they were going to go out and track down and prosecute every polluter on the Hudson. And that's how it started. 18 months later, they collected the first bounty in the United States history against a corporate polluter. They got uh, they got, they shut down the Penn Central Pipe for good. They got to keep $2,000, which was a huge amount of money in Crotonville, New York in 1968. There were two weeks of wild celebration in the town, and then they used the money that was left over to go after Sebagaygi and Tuck Tape and the standard brands that American Cyanamid, the biggest corporations in America, and winning, you know, in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars in 1973. They collected the biggest penalty in the United States history against corporate polluters. They got $200,000 from Anaconda Wire and Cable for dumping toxics at Hastings, New York. Uh, 
into the Hudson, and they used that money to construct a boat, which they called the Riverkeeper. Um, in 1983, they used bounty money to hire their first full-time Riverkeeper, a former commercial fisherman named John Cronin. He hired me using bounty money a year later as the prosecuting attorney for the group, and then, you know, we went to war. And since then, we've brought over 500 successful legal actions on the Hudson. We forced polluters. 500? Yeah, we, we made polluters spend over five and a half billion dollars remediating the river and, um, and in penalties. And the Hudson, during that time, became an international model for ecosystem protection because it was, you know, when I first started river, working on the river, there were still fires on the river where the water, you know, the surface was burning. There was uh, huge fish kills. There were, the river was still changing color depending on what colors they painted the GM, plant, the, the trucks at the GM plant in Tarrytown. Um, and uh, there were a lot of species in the river that were, um, you know, that were endangered. Today, the Hudson is the richest waterway on the east coast of North America. It produces more pounds of fish per acre, more biomass per gallon than any other waterway in the Atlantic Ocean on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, it's the last major river system left in the North Atlantic that still has strong spawning stocks of, of, of almost all of its commercial, the traditional commercial species, the anadromous species of fish. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a species warehouse. It's the last refuge for many of these animals that are going extinct elsewhere. So the miraculous resurrection of the Hudson inspired the creation of river keepers and water keepers and bay keepers and sound keepers and creek keepers. Yeah, all of these different, and then those groups came together. The first, I think, 16 of those groups came together in like 1993. And there was so much demand at that point for licensing new groups that we, um, we formed an alliance that would network the groups and then also would license and establish licensing standards so that new groups could get started that met you know, our standards. So every group has to have a patrol boat, they have to have a full-time paid water keeper, and they have to be willing to use litigation in order to defend the river and the communities that live along the river. And how many chapters or members are there today? Today, there are 320 chapters in, uh, in I think, 36 countries, and we patrol millions of miles of waterway every year. And we have, you know, we have a hundred, hundreds of attorneys that work for us. And I, I heard recently that 25% of the Clean Water Act cases that have ever been brought in this country have been brought by water keepers. Wow.